Hello and welcome to the Island Ponds Community Workshop. On behalf of Great Pond Foundation's leadership and staff, I just wanted to say we're so glad to have you here today. My name is Emily Reddington and I'm the Executive Director of Great Pond Foundation. The reason we're here today is because we have an island full of community members who care about our ponds. And so we're here to talk about some of the things that are most relevant mm -hmm. to this community. And I'm handing it over to David Bauk, Great Pond Foundation's Watershed Outreach Manager. Thanks, David. Thanks, Emily. Uh, so yes, everyone, welcome. Uh, this entire series of events was made possible through the generous support of the ED Foundation that has our collective and heartfelt gratitude for their dedication to our island community. Um, before we get started, I'd like to take this opportunity to again thank the members of our steering committee, Amy Salzman and Greg Colermo, for their tireless efforts in making these events a success. I'd like to thank our keynote speaker, Elizabeth Durkee, for lending us her time today and I'd also like to give a special thank you to all of our panelists for granting us their time, wisdom, and expertise for today's panel discussion. Lastly, I'd like to thank our island community as a whole for all the wonderful feedback we received while creating these events and for their collective dedication and care in managing our shared island pond resources. The Island Ponds Community Workshop was created from a recognized desire for increased communication and collaboration between the many public entities, nonprofit organizations, riparian owners associations, and individuals who manage and care for our island ponds. The primary goal of this series is to help build and reinforce a community among pond managers. And it is our hope that the topics discussed herein will help to foster a greater understanding of the collective issues we face in all the ponds and watersheds across Martha's Vineyard as well as provide inspiration for more action-oriented conversations and initiatives in the future. For the curious members of the public who are joining us today, we hope that these workshops will provide you with a glimpse of some of the major issues that we as a community are facing. Now, this series was comprised of three separate events throughout this winter. The primary subject of each workshop was determined through an outreach survey that we conducted to gauge the overall interest in a variety of important issues facing our island ponds. We received an outstanding response to that survey the results of which determine the content of these events. In our first two workshops, we focused on excess nitrogen pollution, as well as harmful algal blooms and invasive species. And today, we'll shift our focus to data collection and pond management in the era of climate change. Now, before we get started, I'll just quickly explain the structure of this workshop. So this entire event is being recorded and will afterwards be accessible to the public through the Great Pond Foundation's website. Everyone who has attended our workshops will receive a notice as soon as the recordings are available. We're using a Zoom webinar format, so all attendees are automatically muted with video turned off so that we can focus on our speakers. In a few moments, I'm going to hand over the microphone to Liz Durkee for her keynote presentation, for which there'll be a short question and answer session at the end. If you have a question, please type them into your chat window, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. We will take questions on a first come first serve basis and we're going to do our best to field as many as possible in the time provided. After our keynote segment, Great Pond Foundation Scientific Program Director, Julie Pringle, is going to give us a brief presentation on different types of water quality data and why they matter. This is going to take us right into our panel discussion, at which point we will continue taking questions from the audience. Again, please utilize your chat function to type your questions and we're going to do our best to get to as many of them as we can. So now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Elizabeth Durkee. So after serving as a conservation agent for the town of Oak Bluffs for 26 years, Liz is now applying her immense talent and experience island-wide as a climate change planner for the Martha's Vineyard Commission. Together with many island community leaders and her colleagues at the MVC, she's been working tirelessly to develop the Climate Action Plan. Today, she's gonna to share with us her work with an emphasis on how the challenges imposed by climate change may have a particular impact on the health and sustainability of our island ponds. And to me, Liz, it sounds like we're already in your debt. And I wanna thank you for being here today and um, for sharing this really critical and important work. Um, and I'll hand the mic over to you if you're ready. Thank you, David. <clears throat> and thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here to share this information. Can everyone see this? Okay. Um, again, thank you very much to the Great Pond Foundation for having me here today. Um, I'm gonna to talk about the big picture today, how climate change is affecting the island's coastal pond ecosystems. I took a biplane ride 
uh, last summer. And this is a photo on the left of the South Shore. You can see from the air how precarious the land is, especially considering sea level rise, stronger storms, and higher storm surge. And the photo on the right is a shot of the Senja Kentucket Pond and Salt Marsh system. Let me just. I want to take a quick look at some climate change projections. Um, the Northeast United States will be hotter, wetter, and have higher sea level rise than the global average. A temperature increase of two to five degrees over the course of 30 years is a very extreme increase with impacts to the land and the water, as well as our human health. Increasing water temperatures and more rain will affect the ponds. Sea level rise uh, is difficult to predict. It depends, for example, on how fast the ice sheets melt and how quickly we decrease our greenhouse gas emissions. But in 45 years from 1970 to 2016, sea level rise rose six inches and now we could see six inches to over a foot in less than 10 years. As the oceans warm, hurricanes are likely to move farther north with greater frequency. And that's, this is all very sobering news. Um, but if we act wisely, we can adapt now to many of these impacts. Why do we care about these coastal pond ecosystems? The ponds themselves provide us with food and recreation. They're aesthetically pleasing. They support wildlife habitat and support our local economy. And the eelgrass in the ponds uh, store a significant amount of carbon, which is a greenhouse gas. Blue carbon is carbon that's stored in coastal ecosystems, specifically healthy eelgrass and salt marshes. Healthy eelgrass meadows can capture and store carbon 10 times faster than forests. Eelgrass supports wildlife habit, habitat and helps minimize erosion and helps support the economy. Uh, healthy salt marshes absorb at least three times as much carbon as an equivalent area of mature tropical rainforest. On the other hand, unhealthy marshes um, can actually emit carbon. I am a huge fan of salt marshes. Um, they're amazing. They, uh, in addition to absorbing all the carbon, they are the base of the rain food chain, habitat for fish and shellfish, coastal and migratory birds, and so many other creatures. Um, they absorb and contain and slowly release stormwater that would otherwise flood homes and roads. They filter pollutants that would end up in the pond otherwise. They support recreation and the local economy. Barrier beaches protect the ponds and salt marshes from storms. They're always changing. They're never ever the same. They provide us with recreation, support wildlife, are incredibly beautiful. And as we all know, our economy is largely based on our beaches and our coastal ecosystems. So before I get into the climate change issues, I just wanna um, note that something that we all already know, and that is that excess nitrogen is a major problem with our ponds and the need to address that is critical. Nitrogen also has negative impacts on salt marshes. Nitrogen can weaken the roots of salt marsh plants and cause erosion of the marshes. So the need to address nitrogen to help is to protect both the ponds and the salt marshes. Um, as Bill Wilcox mentioned yesterday, um, we can't definitively tie all the pond problems we're looking at to climate change, but, but here is what we're looking at and what we're seeing. When it comes to warmer water, bacteria grows faster in the warmer water and can cause human and shellfish diseases. Warmer water also affects plant and animal diversity and it can contribute to dead zones and also to eelgrass loss. Storms push sand into the ponds, which affects pond circulation. Storms cause erosion of the barrier beaches and the salt marsh edges. They cause the barrier beaches to breach for better or for worse. Um, on the left, you can see a picture of the right fork at South Beach after a storm last year. The dunes were basically flattened. Um, stronger storms can also add much water to salt marshes, so much water that um, sometimes they can't handle it anymore. This marsh on the lower left, on the lower right, I'm sorry, is a marsh on Seaview Avenue in Oak Bluffs that overflowed after a particular storm. 
Increasing and heavier rains send more nutrient runoff into the ponds and contribute to algae blooms that can affect human health, wildlife, the environment, and the economy. Other pollutant runoff will also increase, including gas and oil and things like animal waste. Ocean acidity corrodes the calcium carbonate shells of shellfish. Scallops are particularly susceptible to that. And ocean acidity also operations in the marine food chain and uh, impacts to marine organism growth. Other impacts include habitat loss and marine invasives like the green crab. I think the Boston Globe magazine did a report on green crabs recently. And um, there's a push to serve them in restaurants. Apparently, they're very tasty. Um, so that's a good, good way to look at an invasive species. The salt marsh sparrow is not likely to survive. They live in the high marsh that is flooding more frequently due to sea level rise. And they're the only songbird species whose cycle, whose life cycle is entirely dependent on the marsh. Standing water from high tides and sea level rise and storms can um, kill the salt marsh grasses. It's called salt marsh dieback. There are two schools of thought on Phragmites. Is it good or is it bad? On the one hand, it crowds out native plants and reduces wildlife habitat. On the other hand, it takes up more carbon, apparently, than native wetland grasses, and its detritus builds up faster, which helps protect against erosion and sea level rise. Um, this is a discussion for another day or another whole workshop, in fact. Um, there's a lot of differing opinions on this. Those amazing salt marshes I talked about are at serious risk of sea level rise. Will they migrate inland fast enough to keep up with the pace of sea level rise? And what happens when they can't migrate inland because homes are in the way? And I'll talk a bit about more of that more in a moment. Um, sea level rise and storms erode barrier beaches and decrease their ability to protect the ponds and the marshes. Um, there's also, it's going to impact, include a rise in the coastal water table, and we're already seeing some saltwater intrusion into low-lying wells. So, what is being done and what can be done to address climate change? Well, pond associations, shellfish constables, the Martha's Vineyard Shellfish Group, and many, many others are already working on this. And thank you to the Great Pond Foundation for your work and for this workshop. Um, still, there's a lot more work that needs to be done to focus on the climate impacts. Um, some of the things that are being done, in addition to propagating shellfish, the Martha's Vineyard Shellfish Group is working to grow eelgrass. They put shellfish shells back in the water to buffer acidity and create habitat for shellfish spat to grow. And they're also addressing Phragmites as a means of nitrogen removal. Uh, retired shellfish group director Rick Carney uh, led the group several years ago that put together the Blue Pages, a guide to protecting our island waters. Um, and I have to say that was one of the most enjoyable committees I ever worked on. We had a lot of laughs putting together that booklet. Uh, the aquaculture company Cottage City Oysters grows sugar kelp by their oysters to buffer them from the water's acidity. So there's a lot of creative work going on on the island. Um, and shellfish constables, of course, spend all their working hours focusing on the pond ecosystems. Um, and Rick Carney once also told me that shellfish have a lot of genetic diversity, which may help them adjust to the climate impacts. Science and research is a critical part of the work we do at the Martha's Vineyard Commission. Sherry Casseau and her water quality team are super busy testing pond water quality, developing the 208 water quality management plan, and producing state of the pond reports. There's a permeable, I knew I was gonna mess up that word, permeable reactive barrier by Lagoon Pond that's absorbing more nitrogen than was anticipated. And a new grant is gonna be paying for two new permeable reactive barriers in Oak Bluffs. The commission's also working on watershed management and with Tisbury on stormwater management. The Commission's Climate Action Task Force and staff use science to guide our planning. Um, we're doing a salt marsh study that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, the Storm Tide Pathways study has identified over 700 inland paths that water will take as the sea rises. Once we know where these paths are, which we'll, we, we, know, we will know very soon, we can work 
on addressing them. Um, so that's a really critical study. A carrying capacity study will help us understand this question. Where is the limit of development envi and environmental disruption when the impacts become irreversible? Climate modeling will look at heat, rain, et cetera, in the past, present, and future to help with climate resilience planning. A carbon sequestration study is going to help us tell us how much carbon the island, land, and waters already absorb and can guide us as we look at how we can absorb more carbon. And the Climate Action Plan I will talk about in just a bit. The Oak Bluffs Planning Board and Conservation Commission, along with the Commission and the Village and Wilderness Project, are looking at a salt marsh migration on Senja Kentucky Pond. We hired Rob Young, who's a coastal geologist and director of the Center for Developed Shorelines, which is affiliated with Western Carolina and Duke Universities. Um, this map shows Majors Cove in Senja Kentucky Pond. The green area is marsh migration with three feet of sea level rise and the pink dots are houses. You can see that in many places it can't migrate. The marshes can't migrate much more due to the houses in their way. We're looking at a form of managed retreat where perhaps the property owners will eventually sell their land to the land bank perhaps so that the land can be returned to its natural state and the marshes will be able to migrate inland. The land bank has removed houses so the land can perform its natural functions. They've done that on Chappaquiddick and on Lake Tajmu. Uh, and we're really, really lucky to have the land bank here for, for this and many other reasons, um, because in other communities, the towns um, end up purchasing property to um, deal with issues of managed retreat uh, along with the state and federal government. But um, we, we have the land bank to help us with that. Pond water can be improved by creating openings to the sea. Um, I think other people on the panel know more about that than me. Enlarging culverts can also do the same. At Farm Pond in Oak Bluffs, right here, uh, the Mass Estuaries Project report concluding that, concluded that enlarging the culvert would reduce the nitrogen in that pond to acceptable levels. Just enlarging the culvert, a very simple solution. But that project has been in the permitting stage for years. One thing that would really help is for the permitting agencies to simplify the permitting process for all of us dealing with coastal climate change issues. And another point that's important to make is that the regulations are not keeping up with the climate change science. Another good idea for the island would be to have an island-wide dredge management plan to dredge the ponds add the sand to the eroding beaches and replant the dunes. The Wampanoag tribe plants beach grass every year at Lobsterville Beach and it's actually become kind of a social event for, for the citizens up there. This is South Beach after that storm I mentioned early, uh, last year. Egertown dredged Katama Bay and rebuilt and replanted those dunes. Green infrastructure is a more natural way to handle and filter storm water than the old way of pipes that drain into the water. Bioswales use vegetation to absorb and filter water. These two photographs on the left are bioswales type um, systems at the Martha's Vineyard Hospital. The Oak Bluffs Conservation Commission required that they use green infrastructure when they rebuilt the hospital. The island has many, many parks, especially Oak Bluffs, and parks can be built, and this is being done in other places, where they act as parks most of the time, but then after a storm, they, they, are, they um, become water, stormwater retention basins. Um, and doing that adds public benefits by having a new park, and it channels the water where we want it to go. Uh, Man-made channels like this one also can direct the water where we want it to go. Permeable pavement is pavement that allows water to flow through or between it. Um, oyster shell breakwaters built offshore can buffer storm waves. And although this doesn't really have to do with green infrastructure, uh, the towns can and should update their floodplain bylaws to include green infrastructure and um, development regulations in the flood zone. Protecting open space is a form of climate change resilience. On this property and any property that's preserved, 
There will be no new houses built near the shore that we have to worry about them getting damaged in storms. Uh, there'll be no new septic systems releasing nitrogen. There'll be no roads and driveways adding runoff among all these many other benefits. Lawns have very little to no environmental value. They don't support wildlife or diversity. They don't control erosion or help filter rainwater anywhere nearly as well as plants and trees. They're treated with fertilizers, although we do have fertilizer regulations on the islands. Any carbon that lawns store is offset by the fossil fuel generated equipment used to maintain them. And the island land, you know, is already stressed by climate impacts, and we should be focusing on less lawn and more plants that are suited to the local climate and that require less water and less maintenance. Biodiversity Works Natural Neighbors Program is a wonderful example of this. They provide guidance to homeowners on more natural landscapes. Um, and um, and don't, don't even get me started on lawn irrigation. Uh, it wastes our drinking water and it runs into the streets where it picks up pollutants and then runs into our ponds. One of the things I hope to do is find some funding to do an island-wide salt marsh assessment. Uh, that way we can determine the um, quality of each of our salt marshes, uh, prioritize them and restore them and find ways to help them migrate inland. There are several ways to help restore degraded salt marshes. Edge restoration, like the project on the left has been done at the Felix Neck Wildlife Sanctuary on Sengic and Tackett Pond. Thin layer deposition is the spraying of liquefied dredge material onto the marshes to raise their elevation. And runnels are a concept that are being tried in Rhode Island. They're narrow channels that are dug to drain standing water in the marshes to help improve plant growth and build up the marshes. The material that they excavate is used to fill marsh depressions and then they're planted with marsh grasses. The runnels don't open to the water like the existing mosquito ditches do. Those ditches carry more water in and end up degrading the marsh. So it'll be interesting to follow how that works in Rhode Island. When I worked in Oak Bluffs, I wanted to find out the dollar value of the services provided by the town's coastal ecosystems. Those services include food like fish and shellfish, flood protection, wildlife habitat, and recreation. So we got funding to do an ecosystem services study and the dollar value, as you can see, was very, very high. Um, imagine how much it would cost to replicate the flood control services that are provided by our salt marshes. So uh, knowing this is a good incentive to protect our coastal salt marshes. And it's probably valuable in getting grant funding to do so as well. Making the island and the pond ecosystems more resilient to climate change will be good for the economy and create local jobs. We need to train local residents for these jobs and keep them on island. Some of the climate related jobs include salt marsh restoration, dredging, dune restoration, a lot of green infrastructure, regenerative landscaping, and, um, and more aquaculture, which uh, protects the water quality, provides local food, um, and creates local jobs. The Martha's Vineyard Commission has begun work on a climate action plan, and I'm so excited about this plan. Um, it's a community-based plan with local lead consultant We've got over 100 local residents taking part in these six thematic working groups, developing the plan's goals and strategies. All six of these themes in one way or another relate to the health of our coastal ecosystems. Uh, helping us develop this plan are a couple of very experienced off-island consultants. Um, the ERG group helped the Cape Cod Commission look at economic, the economics of climate change for their Cape Cod Climate Action Plan, and now they're going to be working with us as well. And Matthias Bo, a Dutch planner who spoke on the island in 2019, um, is working with us to address transportation infrastructure and land use. Uh, and he brings a wealth of experience. The Dutch have been dealing with water issues for centuries. Um, and his talk in 2019 was very inspiring. We're soon gonna have a website in place so the public can learn about the plan and also about what every one of us can do to help make the island more climate resilient.
The website will also be used to track implementation of the plan. This is not a plan that's gonna sit on a shelf or on a website. The plan will identify who's responsible for implementing each of the actions and the jobs will be collaborative. The towns and the commission will be working with conservation groups, pond associations, so get ready. <laughs> the tribe, food security, public health groups, organizations, emergency managers, business, renewable energy groups. Um, it's gonna be all hands on deck. This is gonna be a community-wide effort to implement the goals and strategies defined in the climate action plan. Everyone in the, is gonna be encouraged to take action. Um, the Island Climate Action Network website has great information on what each of us can do to make a positive difference. Um, and as I'm winding up here, I just wanna say that I hope all of you will take part in Climate Action Week. There will be events and activities across the island for an entire week to encourage community engagement in climate resilience. And there's gonna be a big fun finale at the Grange on Saturday, the 14th of May. And my final slide, I just wanna leave you um, with this thought, this quote from an author, Jeff Goodell. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer questions. All right, thank you very much, Liz, that was great. Um, yeah, if you have a few minutes, uh, we will just ask you a couple of questions. The first one I've got here is, uh, what are the three most important things vineyard residents can do now to support the ponds as we face and prepare for future climate challenges? Three things, wow. Or four or five or... <laughs> <laughs> um... You can, um, let's see, why don't we just go crazy here? Put an alternative innovative septic system component on your septic system so your system doesn't um, release nitrogen into the groundwater that leads into the pond. Um, you can, um, as I said, you know, look at your property, you know, less lawn, more um, plants and trees. Trees are, you know, trees are, Trees are our best friends. Um, and, you know, if you have a paved driveway, think about, you know, putting a shell driveway or a crushed stone driveway. If you have a cement patio, think about, you know, putting bluestone instead that leaves room for um, water to filter in. Um, because, you know, everything that flows off our property ends up in the street and a lot of that picks up other pollutants and ends up in the ponds. And, you know, don't use pesticides or herbicides or any sides. <laughs> yeah, I think that's more I, than three. <laughs> well, that's great, and I think it's it, it, to your point too. It's that it's the thing is that the predictions of climate change is going to exacerbate all the those those problems that kind of already exist right now. So those the nitrogen issues, the runoff issues, how the land is used, and, and on the periphery of the pond. That, that even still addressing those age old problems is is still going to help a lot. Um, <clears throat> Let's see here. Uh, you you listed a larger uh, that large array of concerns for our ponds in the context of climate change. Um, is there a particular issue that concerns you most? Well, you know, I worked for the Oak Bluffs Conservation Commission for twenty six years, and a lot of that focus was on salt marsh protection. And I really. Um, I think salt marshes provide so many incredible services to us. And one of the things they do is they filter a lot of the pollutants that would otherwise go into the pond. They also protect us against flooding. They, they, their value is so critical to, um, to us as human beings, but also to the, the, the ecosystem in general. Um, and I, I really think, you know, if we lose the salt marshes, we're going to lose all those values. And it's going to cost us a lot of money to provide the services we need that they're no longer doing for us. And I, I think protecting our salt marshes is, is critical. Um, yeah. Oh, good. Um, let's see here. Uh, I have a question from uh, Mr. Chris Murphy. Uh, and he asked, Liz, uh, why do you think removing homes in the way of sea level rise is the responsibility of the towns and not the homeowner? Ooh. Um, well, <laughs> well, homeowners may just decide when their houses are flooded every day to um, remove them or sell them. Um, but
but the trend in in across the country, especially I think after Hurricane Sandy, um, was that the state government and especially and towns as well um, offered incentives to people to remove their houses so that um, the land could be returned to its natural function and help protect you know the rest of the more inland properties um, and you know e even if it's a state um, program I think a lot there are towns who are also you know spending money buying property in forms of managed retreat so I just I, I feel that we're very fortunate to have an organization that can help us do that yeah and it seems like time is of the essence too. So it's you know it, getting this, getting these uh, initiatives up and rolling is is key. Any help we can get is is welcome. Uh, let's see. I've got a question here from uh, Gerald Jones. Can you say more about marsh retreats? Um, he's saying I assume it's good, but what is the good? Any bad? Is there any bad that can come from that? Retreat? From marshes retreating inland. Um, the the only downside is for the people who have properties abutting the salt marshes. Um, you know, if we it, it, salt marshes are the base of the marine food chain. If we want to be able to eat fish and shellfish, we need salt marshes. Um, if we want coastal birds to have a place to feed and nest, we need salt marshes. If we want our ponds clean, we need salt marshes. Um, if we want to protect the land against flooding, we need salt marshes. Um, so they're very critical part of the ecosystem and um, they naturally migrate. They will naturally migrate inland if they can, if they're not blocked. Hmm. And another critical point is if they can do so fast enough to over, to beat the rising sea, basically. And that's, that's something clearly we have no control over. Right, that's a very good point. And you have rising sea levels and increasing frequency and intensity of um, severe storm activity too. Does that actually do hurricanes? I know that salt marshes and other like dune grass habitats, barrier beach habitats are really good at buttressing against those extreme events. But is there a like a long term concern if it's the frequency is is ramped up? The frequency and the um... As the sea rises, the storm surges, the level of the water gets higher, and that causes more erosion of the barrier beach and the dune system, which then impacts the pond, which then impacts the salt marsh and erodes the edges of the salt marsh and can flood the salt marsh. So um, it's just, you know, it's all, it's all connected. Yeah. Um, let's see, I have a, another question here from Victoria Riskin regarding the culvert. Which agencies are responsible for permitting? Uh, for the farm pond culvert. <laughs> um, well, it's located under a Massachusetts state owned road. So Mass DOT is involved. Um, Mass DEP, I think chapter 91 waterways. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers is probably involved. Um, the Department of Ecological Restoration has been involved. Um, the local conservation commission obviously is involved. There's so many agencies involved and right. the regulations are just, they're old and they're not designed to address the kinds of problems that we're having now. Mm -hmm. And the permitting process is um, so long and so expensive. Engineers and experts have to be hired to do studies and um, I mean, which I don't think is a bad thing. We want to make sure we're doing the right thing, but it's it's excessive. And as right. the climate impacts are getting more and more severe, I, I think it would be great if the permitting agencies could um, come up with a system that would make it easier and less expensive for towns to go through the permitting process. So having that ability to, to be a bit more agile in, in getting this stuff approved. And it does depend if it's under, if it's not under a state road, that completely changes the pathway, doesn't it? That takes one big chunk out of the pile. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I think I've got, let's see, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, and I have one here from Valerie Becker. Um, has there been any attempt to measure the nitrogen content in the rainfall landing on any of our ponds watersheds? 
Uh, not that I'm aware of. I don't know if any of the pond associations or shellfish groups have any information on that. Yeah, it's that deposition of atmospheric nitrogen into the actual rainfall. We haven't done that, maybe not yet, um, yeah. but that's yeah. definitely a good question. Um, and then one more question, and this was actually a follow-up from Victoria Riskin. Um, how much would the, in your guess, how much would the salt marsh assessment cost? I actually have no idea. It's on my to-do list and I haven't gotten to it yet. <laughs> I'm sure that's a, a lengthy to-do list. <laughs> it grows every day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, great. I think that's, um, that's about the time we have for uh, questions with your presentation. I'll, I'll remind our audience again that we'll be able to take more questions once we switch into the panelist situation. Um, Liz, thank you so much for that presentation. It was wonderful. And you're thank doing you. some really important work. Thank and you you're sticking much. around for our panel session. So we'll, we'll yep. look forward to hearing from you again. All right. So now, now that we understand um, some of the issues that the island ponds community is facing in regards to climate change, um, it's time to discuss how we as pond managers can work together to meet these challenges. And to facilitate this discussion, we're gonna hear a presentation from Great Pond Foundation Scientific Program Director, Julie Pringle. And she's gonna share with us a primer on the types of data that we use to understand these uh, systems. Julie, thank you again very much for putting this together. I know you're busy. Um, I'm gonna hand the mic over to you. Great, thanks, David. Let me share my screen. Can everyone see my presentation? Perfect. Okay, so today um, I'm going to go over the basics of a water quality monitoring program, the different types of data, the parameters that are measured, how we collect them, the tools that are used, and really what it all means for pond health. So I'm going to go over the different tools and how we measure these variables. Um, my presentation today is going to focus on the Great Pond Foundation water quality monitoring program. However, these tools are universally used. Um, the commission's program is very, very similar as is other programs across the region and the country really. So first, the first tool that we use is called a SECI disc. This is a standardized black and white disc pictured here. Um, it's connected to a rope or a measuring tape and you lower it into the water and the depth at which this disc disappears from sight corresponds to water clarity and water transparency. Um, and that, that measurement is called the second depth. So if the water is clear, like in this picture, the Secchi disc is visible at a deep depth. And if it's relatively shallow, you can see the disc at the, the bottom of the pond. But if the water is cloudy and murky, like in this picture, then the Secchi disc will disappear from sight um, at a shallow depth. The next tool that we use to collect water quality data is our handheld digital water quality meter. It's a mouthful. Um, but what we use is a YSI Pro DSS pictured here. It's essentially a handheld computer that we take with us out in the field. It has a long cable attached to the probe. And on this probe, we can connect various sensors. And these sensors collect all sorts of data, um, some of which are listed here. We can measure salinity, which is the salt content of the water, temperature, depth, pH, which is the acidity of the water, whether it's acidic or basic. Turbidity, which is the amount of dissolved particles. Turbidity is related to the, the Secchi disk, the Secchi depth that I mentioned before. Um, high turbidity is cloudy water. Uh, water with low turbidity is really clear. And lastly, we collect data on dissolved oxygen. And what is um, surprisingly important within all these parameters is the depth. So um, we lower this probe into the water and you can measure how these parameters change with depth because often uh, what's at the surface is a little bit different from what's going on at the bottom of the pond. 
The next type of data we collect is nutrient data. And as we've learned from our previous workshops, uh, nutrients are really important to monitor, mostly because unfortunately our ponds and coastal ecosystems are suffering from excess nutrients. And this excess nutrients can lead to eutrophication and various other problems down the line. So we measure different kinds of nutrients like phosphate, silicate, and different forms of nitrogen, such as nitrate and ammonium. We collect water samples from mid-depth using this Van Dorn bottle and send those water samples off to Woods Hole for further analysis. Lastly, we measure chlorophyll concentrations and cyanobacteria levels. Chlorophyll is the pigment that plants use to capture sunlight for photosynthesis. So by measuring chlorophyll, you can obtain an estimate of the amount of microscopic plants in the water. We call those plants phytoplankton. And this can be an indicator of impairment because if there are a lot of extra nutrients in the water, that can spur extra growth of these phytoplankton. And that can lead to declines in water quality. And cyanobacteria are growing increasingly um, important to measure and monitor because some cyanobacteria produce toxins that are known to cause harm to human health. So um, it's a relatively new addition to our water quality monitoring program, but extremely important. So these data are collected at numerous sampling stations in each pond. On the left, I have Chilmore Pond. The right is Agartown Great Pond. You can see all these dots. Uh, we um, use those tools I mentioned in the last slide at each of these stations. And we try to maximize the number of stations in a pond so that we can have adequate spatial resolution in our data. So for instance, if salinity is different on the south side of the pond compared to the north side of the pond, we'll capture those differences. And we visit these stations at least once a week in the summertime. So that was a very quick introduction of the types of data we collect and um, how we collect them, but what does it all mean in the context of pond health? So there are various governmental agencies that publish guidelines and criteria for these parameters and what makes a healthy pond. So these are listed here. Dissolved oxygen should be at least six milligrams per liter. pH should be between 6.5 and 8.5. Temperature should not exceed 85 degrees Fahrenheit. The transparency as measured by the Secchi disk should be between 1.5 and three meters. Three meters is a little bit less than 10 feet, so that's pretty deep. A lot of our ponds aren't quite that deep. Um, total nitrogen should be between 0.28 and 0.6 milligrams nitrogen per liter. This varies a lot based on the ecosystem in question. Um, the MEP and the state have done studies and published total maximum daily load values for nitrogen. And that um, kind of gives you an idea of the total acceptable level of nitrogen in each system. And lastly, chlorophyll A pigments should be between three and 10 micrograms per liter to be considered a healthy unimpaired ecosystem. So I'm gonna go um, into a little bit more detail for a couple parameters that I think are really important to understand. The first is salinity, which is the concentration of dissolved salts. This is measured in parts per thousand, which is abbreviated PPT. You sometimes can see it measured in practical salinity units, PSU. These two measurements are pretty much interchangeable. Um, but one way that you can think about salinity and visualize it is the amount of water, um, the, amount, the number of molecules of salt dissolved in water in a beaker, which is pictured in this graphic here. So tap water is fresh water. It has zero parts per thousand. Salinity, technically, it can be up to 0.5 ppt. So there are no salt molecules in this water. And on the other end of the spectrum is the, um, the Dead Sea, which is famous for being very, very salty. 
and the salinity in the Dead Sea exceeds 300 parts per thousand. The Atlantic Ocean varies. It can be between 32 and 35 parts per thousand. And our salt ponds, our great ponds, are what's called brackish, so a um, in between freshwater and ocean water. Um, here it says Egerton Great Pond, so that's 20 to 25. Some other ponds are less than that. Here is a graph of salinity. Um, you can see salinity in parts per thousand between 10 and 30 on the vertical axis, the y axis. The x axis is time. Here it's months uh, in 2019. And this is showing data from Station 2 in Egertown Great Pond. The different colors correspond to different depths at which the data were collected. Um, so surface, mid-depth, and bottom. And what's really obvious from this plot are these big spikes in salinity. And of course, these spikes occur after the pond was open to the ocean. So here, um, salinity was about 18 parts per thousand before the cut, the cut happened. And really quickly, the salinity rose up to almost 30. And you can see there's a difference between the salinity on the bottom and the salinity on the surface. This is called stratification. And over time, the stratification erodes and they um, become very similar across the whole water column. But there's a pretty steady decline in salinity as the pond is closed, it fills back up, and then a large spike again when the pond is cut again. And for Egerton Great Pond, I like to mark off this 15 parts per thousand mark because Egerton Great Pond is lucky in that there are lots of uh, beautiful eelgrass meadows and eelgrass is a species that prefers salty water uh, compared to more brackish water. So um, below 15 ppt is when the eelgrass starts to suffer. And um, I just like to make it obvious whenever we're below that salinity. Why is it not? There we go. Um, another way to visualize salinity and to look at salinity, da salinity data is spatially on a map. So this, these uh, white boxes are showing the salinity values at the different water sampling stations before a cut. They're all about 18, 19 parts per thousand. And after the cut, they jump up to around 26 to 30 parts per thousand. The blue boxes show the increase in salinity that occurred at that station. So you can see that every station experienced an increase, and even these northernmost stations saw an increase in salinity, and that indicates that the whole pond was flushed with salty water, and therefore the cut was successful. So we can use these data in different ways to evaluate things like the success of a cut. Another crucial parameter to understand is dissolved oxygen which is very self-explanatory. It's the concentration of oxygen dissolved in the water. This is most often measured in milligrams per liter, but you can see other units such as parts per million or percent saturation. And oxygen is important because most organisms require it for their metabolism, just like we require oxygen to breathe. Um, oxygen enters water via two pathways. It can come from the atmosphere and it's also produced from plants via photosynthesis. However, there are biological processes that can consume oxygen, such as respiration and decomposition. And these processes actually occur at a faster rate with warmer temperatures. So in the summer, you often see depletions in dissolved oxygen in our local ponds and waterways. So here I'm showing a plot of dissolved oxygen. Once again, the DO is on the Y axis between two and 12 milligrams per liter. The X axis is time in months. This is station two in Egertown Great Pond again, which is right here. Um, so uh, uh, for DO, we like to emphasize this six milligrams per liter 
threshold that the MEP study, the Massachusetts Estuaries Project published where above six is considered a healthy ecosystem below six signs of impairment. And four milligrams per liter or less is the red zone where animals begin to become oxygen stressed and there's not enough oxygen for them to get as much as they need. Um, and below two is actually when you can start to see mortality and it's considered hypoxic waters. So this plot is showing the same three depths at which the, the DO was taken. And the overall um, trend I want you all to notice is the seasonal trend where um, dissolved oxygen at all depths is lower in the summertime compared to the spring and the fall. And also the bottom depths, this gray line here, um, bottom waters experience more depletions in oxygen and they're more likely to have these lower DO values and sometimes even into this red zone. So um, that can be an indicator of impairment. So dissolved oxygen is actually a pretty tricky and complicated uh, variable because it changes with things like temperature and salinity. As temperatures increase, um, the solubility of dissolved oxygen lowers. So the amount of oxygen that can physically and chemically be dissolved in that water is lower with warmer temperatures. And it's the same trend with salinity. Increases in salinity lead to lower dissolved oxygen values based solely off of chemistry and physics. And with that in mind, you can begin to understand how climate change can have an impact on our coastal ponds. So I'm not gonna go into this in a lot of detail because Liz gave a great talk and explained everything, but there are a lot of climate change impacts that are projected to occur and all of these will impact our coastal ponds. So this um, kind of emphasizes why it's so important for us to monitor these water quality parameters and collect data on what's occurring now so we can compare it to what happens in the future and detect these changes. So that's all I have um, for this presentation. Um, I kind of went through this quickly. So if you have questions, please enter them into the chat function and hopefully we can answer them in the panel discussion. If not, my email is right here. It looks like it got cut off a little bit, but I'm always happy to answer questions if you email me. So with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing and I think we can move on to our panel discussion. <laughs>